Indian Trafficking Review. This first open access peer review journal that's dedicated specifically to the issue of human trafficking and uh, explores this issue in its broader context and intersections with gender migration and labor. In April, we published uh, the latest issue, number 14, of this special issue of the Anti-Trafficking Review is Technology, Anti-Trafficking and Speculative Future. Can you share a bit about the motivation for choosing this theme and why it is important to study the role of technology in trafficking and anti-trafficking? And let's start with Jennifer. In my work, a really important theme that's come up related to technology, but also separate from it, are the ways in which presumptions about um, anti-trafficking efforts being helpful, having um, sometimes punitive and in the case of technology, surveillance effects to it. Um, so if I kind of think about the motivations, it may be helpful to um, note for folks that are less familiar with the US social history around anti-trafficking and technology, that there have been many efforts to shutter websites way before FOSTA-SESTA and other um, you know, carceral or police-oriented kind of efforts to, um, to spotlight uh, places that are presumed to give rise to trafficking, specifically online classified ad sites, and the injurious effects of, of that work. So in the simplest terms, I would say a motivating factor of this special issue is to say, what do we really know about what's being done in the name of um, anti-trafficking using technology. So what are the ideological and political effects? But as a social scientist, my, my co-author and colleague in this work, Amitali, is also a social scientist. Can we shine some empirical light on what's actually happening when different kinds of technologies are used um, in order to um, address trafficking? And, I'll just briefly say one thing too. Um, it may be self-evident to many of you on the on, who are here today, but there are a lot of assumptions that circulate in the anti-trafficking space. Assumptions, for instance, that um, trafficker so alleged traffickers are very tech savvy and are always one step ahead of law enforcement. Um, presumptions that if only law enforcement are kind of equipped with more technical tools. They can better assist people in exploitative situations. And so um, for many, this is a timely moment to be wading our way through assumptions in order to see what are the, uh, the not only the racialized, but the gendered effects of some of these technologies. Um, and I think Kate um, um, has done work um, to kind of think about the criminal legal system and how that links to um, technology. So Kate, I'll kick it over to you. Anything that's being touted as an advancement in combating human trafficking, investigating human trafficking, or prosecuting human trafficking generally is quite dangerous for the very people that we're purporting to, to want to help. Um, and our whole legal approach within the U.S. Um, just continues to highlight that over and over again. So in terms of thinking of technology, um, this goes beyond just shutting down a specific website or focusing on what's put, uh, you know, what it, what's disseminated on a particular website to what information is captured and what ways are people um, surveilled using technology and what ways are people's personal information surveilled that we don't even know about for the most part. But it's also um, sort of an opportunity, as Jennifer said, to reflect on this whole approach and who even is being labeled as a trafficker um, under the wide net that is often cast in the US. Um, and Lee Goodmark and I work with many, many women who themselves have been prosecuted for sex trafficking as our piece highlights this edition, who then um, bear the burden of surveillance and enforcement in a very different way. And this is all this structure that was created to go at the bad guys. But I'm not sure that we have real clarity on who the bad guys are and whether we're getting that right and we should be comfortable with that. This also goes back to just general surveillance of people in the sex industry. Um, and so like one example that, that always comes to mind when we're thinking of how information is, can, is collected is um, people arrested for prostitution in New York City have their cell phones taken. The New York City Police Department then takes their cell phone information, often without consent and without a proper warrant. But even beyond that, even if they weren't sort of violating constitutional provisions on searching phones, um, 
they take the mere existence of someone's phone number and enter it into a sort of vast, a vast database containing phone numbers as a way to link people's social connections, link their conduct, and follow their conduct. This never becomes part of the actual criminal prostitution case against someone, but is instead siphoned off um, into this, this database, again, of information that down the line is used in trafficking prosecutions to try to show acting in concert or conspiracy or people working together. And again, we know that the weight of this often falls on women in the sex industry, particularly black and brown women in the sex industry. And what we're learning and seeing over the last many years is that in the US, it's those women who are being prosecuted on the state and federal level as traffickers and then are subject to all the things that Lee and I talk about in our article and we'll talk about again later. So in terms of framing, um, just at the beginning of the conversation, whenever we hear something's an advancement in the fight against human trafficking, um, you should have my face in your mind saying, this is probably bad and this is probably gonna lead to the criminalization of more people. And I also just wanna echo in this particular moment, um, a lot of the pieces in this issue stand in solidarity with sex workers and in this particular moment, especially with black trans sex workers. Um, and thinking then about technology, also acknowledging and honoring all the ways in which sex workers have already been and continue to use different technological platforms to organize not only for their work, but for different political movements. Um, so speaking of that, one thing we wanted to highlight is that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about what technology is and what technology does when we're talking about trafficking. Um, and in this issue, we understand technology as a range of different techniques. So not just the physical digital technologies, but different techniques that are organized by power and are structured by power. And an important thing to think about then is how technology is always co-produced with political and social relationships. Technology is not an external thing that just sort of operates on its own, right? But we must always think about different technologies in their political context and thinking about their racial and gendered arrangements um, in relationship to power. So one thing we've been seeing in the pieces in, um, in this issue highlight, and also mine and Jennifer's work has continued to highlight, is that we see the rise of tech solutionist moral entrepreneurs, right? So people who wield their technological expertise as ways to present um, potential solutions to anti-trafficking, right? Or to, to trafficking itself. Um, and part of this ties into what Jennifer was saying earlier, that this idea that trafficking is this unwieldy and large issue that can only be dealt with technologically. So the moment that trafficking is positioned as a technological problem, it allows for technological solutions to sweep in, right? And offer to solve this issue. Um, when in fact technology is a complex set of political and social relationships and it's not something that can be done as a quick fix. Um, so one thing we're hoping is that this issue offers multiple concrete examples of the ways in which technological interventions don't actually pan out in this particular way, right, in this tech solutionist way. And in order to challenge different structural inequities that make something like worker exploitation possible, we also have to start understanding a more nuanced way of thinking about technology, um, not just as this external factor, but as something that's always implicated um, within power relationships. And this echoes a lot of work that's already been done around thinking about anti-trafficking as a quote unquote rescue industry, as Laura Augustin says, um, this idea that uh, we can just come in and save and solve a particular issue using technology is a fallacy um, and hope something that we hope that this issue um, will challenge uh, as, as some of the speakers today are gonna allude to. You know, one thing we think about with technology is that there's so much hype attached to what a technology can do. And so the hope by many of these tech solutionist entrepreneurs is that um, the technology can be leveraged to quickly solve or fix an issue. Um, so two of the pieces in this issue highlight the use of worker reporting apps, right? So apps that can be used to potentially reduce worker exploitation. Um, I want to highlight um, Stephanie Limoncelli's work, right? And she's analyzing three different work worker apps for ethical consumption. Um, and she notes that there's a number of different problems with these apps, um, primarily that they reinforce this sort of neoliberal ideology that governments should actually play a limited role in solving some of the issues that make trafficking or exploitation possible. 
and instead putting the onus onto businesses and into in the hands of different entrepreneurial efforts. And this is fundamentally a disconnect, right? So one thing we see with the, with the technology quick fix solutions is this idea that individual people can literally hack or um, create their way into solving a much more complex issue. Uh, and on the other hand, we have Annie Fukushima's uh, article, which does analyze a worker app that is designed for and by workers and perhaps offers a different way to think about tech solutionism, right, that actually acknowledges not just the technolo technological platform, but the different workers that are involved and what sort of structural inequities they themselves are trying to challenge. And this, uh, this research used primary data collected from workers in San Francisco, right, in order to actually think about um, real ways in which change be enacted. So in that example, technology is used as a conduit, but is not the solution in and of itself. There's a ton of uh, technological tools out there that are uh, being utilized to address human trafficking. We might see them uh, from things such as wiretapping um, to global positioning um, systems where we can track people's movement um, and things that might not be seemingly as um, obvious, but even state identification in which government is tra um, tracking who we are, right, when we are identified. And we see this um, also for my migrants who are part of these, um, who are being asked to um, submit information or participating in what is called a biometric system. So maybe um, sharing um, their information such as their uh, fingerprints and so forth. Um, but in the anti-trafficking movement, there's been other ways that um, technology has been used uh, from tip lines, uh, which I think goes back to some of the things that, um, you know, was spoken about earlier about surveillance in which, um, you know, it, it then uh, puts it the work on many of us to participate in everyday policing of what's happening in our communities. Um, and so uh, tip lines are, um, you know, part of that. And we see that with national hotlines that people may call. Social service providers themselves also utilize technology um, in ways that uh, might uh, be seemingly um, useful information sharing, uh, but also as a way to track uh, for grant purposes, which gets at some of the comments that were made about neoliberalism. Um, but in my um, article, um, what I really wanted to focus on uh, was the way that, um, uh, you know, when we're looking at immigration and uh, the way that the nation imagines itself, how does it then use these technological tools to um, impact the very communities um, that um, crossing borders. And so uh, what we see is a range of technologies of um, border control from, you know, night vision goggles, CCTV cameras, um, a range of tools. There's just so many tools to surveil borders, both at the physical border as well um, internally um, within uh, the domestic um, scene. And so the technologies are quite uh, wide uh, and ranging. And in my article, I interviewed with San Francisco folks um, to learn more about the way that um, their um, needs were being impacted. And what I learned from them was that, you know, um, in such a rich city, um, there was major disparities that were going on, um, as well as displacements, um, as well as um, ongoing um, policing and surveillance at the localized level, um, in spite of the fact that San Francisco is seen as a rich place. And so we see the kind of um, reality being produced. Ethical consumption apps, and these are apps that are really meant to um, help us, quote unquote, buy our way out of labor exploitation. Um, and these are apps that are developed by tech entrepreneurs, sometimes in conjunction with NGOs, but um, most often not. And they're aimed at consumers providing publicly available information to help them make. Um, choices about the products that they buy. And these products might be clothing items, food items, pie, uh, you name it. And what the apps do is compile publicly available information like news reports um, and uh, articles and so on to uh, help rank companies that are producing these items. And those rankings might be a great ranking like A, B, C, D, they might be uh, on a length of scale from one to five. This way consumers are supposed to be able to then decide what to purchase. The apps also helpfully provide links to other items that you can purchase in other countries. And 
this is all a very appealing idea. I think we've already alluded to this so far um, in the webinar, but it, it basically gives us the idea that there's an app, it's a technical solution, it's an appealing solution, it's a simple thing, and it's also a pleasant and painless way, reportedly, to um, come back to I'm going to be describing um, the article by Lori Berg, Basina Farbenblum, Angela Kitominas, um, who couldn't join us today because of the time zone difference. Um, so their, their piece is titled Addressing Exploitation in Supply Chains as Technology a Game Changer for Worker Voices. Um, and one of the issues that their piece is looking at, it's a worker reporting app um, based on literature review and interviews. And one of the pieces, one of the things that they're looking at is this idea that with more data or big data, worker exploitation can be solved. And this points to a larger issue with technological solutionism, right? This idea of the seductiveness of big data, that the more we have data, the more we'll be able to solve problems. Uh, and what this leads to is a kind of catch-all approach to big data, that the more we have, the more we can then do with it. Um, and what this article points to uh, is an example of this fallacy of this reasoning, right? So one of the things they found in this piece um, is that digital tools may not adequately capture all representative data about these workers, right? And that this data might be vague or superficial. And there's a number of limitations that they point to in this piece. Um, and this is related to a much larger phenomenon that we see around social auditing in general, right? We cannot adequately capture numerical data that will then resolve the issue. It's gonna take much larger structural changes. I was uh, really intrigued and I wanted to think with um, or um, apps and then just tools that are created by um, and with migrant communities themselves. And so um, I um, learned about Contratados, um, which is, um, you know, they were created by Centro de los Derechos del Migrante um, in 2014 and um, and what it allows um, people to do is to anonymously rate their employers so it was kind of imagined as this like um, Yelp meets um, glass um, door and um, and so you have this opportunity where uh, you can rate employers, you can also find employers, um, and you can find um, you know, organizations that are looking to hire people um, and also learn about other migrant experiences. Um, it's both in Spanish and English. Um, and so that's, um, you know, um, opens it up to certain communities in the Latinx community. Um, we recognize that there's a range of languages as well. Um, and so that's one um, app that I was um, looking at that sort of was imagined for and by migrant workers themselves. And I think that that's the, the important messaging is that when we look at um, the kind of tools that are created, who is it for, who's imagining it, and how do we work with the very communities that it's imagined for? Count me a skeptic. Um, what I found with the apps, there, there are several issues. There's practical issues with the apps have to do with the information that is collected, how it's collected, and what is used. Um, the information is ad hoc, it's incomplete, it's often out of date, there's contradictory information. And all of this makes it really hard for um, the so-called experts to make decisions about what's purchased. And in fact, I think that's part of the problem is that um, we're shifting responsibility on holding companies accountable to so-called consumer experts who simply don't have the information that they really need to be able to make decisions. So that's one um, big problem. A, a second one is that the, the apps, nowhere in the apps or the, the information, are workers' voices and experiences really represented. So I think this is in direct contrast to like what Annie is talking about, where the technology is being constructed on the ground, grassroots, bottom up, with the very workers that you're trying to help, rather than in the ethical construction apps being constructed by a tech developer who's doing it from the top down. Um, and the workers in that case really more of the sort of the fodder that they're using for the app rather than partnering with the workers. So that's a second um, problem I think that apps face. Uh, a third one is that um, we don't really have accountability and transparency for the apps, the app developers, companies themselves. Um, the apps provide links to other kinds of products and companies to try to adjust that people buy from them, 
And in that way, they make um, a profit off of those. They also sell user data, track and sell user data, as we were talking about earlier in the webinar. Um, and I think that that should put all users, um, all users should think about whether and how that information that's being provided on the app is actually useful um, and what's happening with the information that's being gathered on the and then last but not least, um, as we mentioned, I think perhaps the assumption about consumption that they are based on that's really reinforcing neoliberal ideas about the role of the government are highly problematic. Um, really what these apps are doing is suggesting that social action shouldn't be social, it should be individual. And they're also suggesting that governments um, either aren't doing or can't play a role in helping to support worker organizing or regulate pollution. And some of the apps do this in a really explicit way, so we can do it implicitly, but in both cases, they're really reinforcing neoliberal ideas. And so for all of these reasons, I think that, um, you know, I would like, as I mentioned, you can count me as about these particular apps. Um, I think what's needed, maybe technology can be really useful in circumstances like what Annie is studying, and we find a kind of grassroots efforts to use technology. Um, that can be useful, but also I think we just need good old-fashioned um, support for worker organizing and good old-fashioned regulation. For folks who are looking for the, the title, this is again the article Addressing Exploitation and Supply Change by, um, Chains rather, by Berg et al. And what was so striking about their article, so much that I thought it warranted like direct quoting, is that you know there's a lot of um, interest among corporations in this otherwise very messy environment to kind of get to the heart of um, labor conditions within really complex global supply chains. And so the kind of, you could say, incentive for different companies is to try to take this otherwise very complicated system and to apply some degree of kind of efficiency. So in their article, they talk a lot about like how tech is premised on this idea of being more efficient, cutting through the complexity. And a kind of watchword that circulates a lot in these data-driven efforts is the notion of objectivity, to objectively kind of um, audit or determine when and where exploitation comes in. But not only do they say that despite the gains or the benefits for corporations around kind of, you know, pr promoting their own, um, um, or rather staving off or preventing reputational risks when and where there might be exploitation in supply chains, but they get to the, the, art, uh, the authors get to the heart of saying, really these um, digital worker reporting tools diminish worker power. So I think that alone, that not only do they maybe not prevent trafficking as one important piece, but that they actually may um, delimit in very active ways collective organizing um, among workers is, is, I think, an empirical finding that really has purchase and certainly in, in, for me, you know, being interested in seeing how um, different kinds of tools that are kind of touted as empowering, um, getting back to what Annie said, like who actually owns and controls the data, how might the presence of a tool, even if kind of pitched as worker oriented, could really further um, create new types of exploitation. Um, and then really simply, and um, but I think impactfully, we really don't know the vast amount of data that's collected and where it might be used beyond the initial purpose and, and, and reason why it was collected in the first instance. And I think this is something Matali and I have talked a lot about is not only what are um, these kind of data-driven interventions doing to address trafficking, but how can the data kind of live in perpetuity and be repurposed and circulate and arguably kind of be a new type of currency in humanitarian work? Um, that there's no kind of like regulatory guardrails in many contexts to you know, um, ensure data protection and um, individual uh, workers' privacy, I think are like first draft concerns, but broader concerns are certainly the ways that these types of data might be used to further surveil and exploit workers. Um, so I think the, the kind of, they don't necessarily, in my reading of their work, they may say it's unsure, but I, I echo Stephanie's point about counting me a skeptic that this actually in fact translates into a prevention of trafficking. In fact, it could create another avenue for worker exploitation that we ought to be paying attention to.
one of the first things that we learned is that you really can't tell the difference between what is an effect of FOSTA-SESTA, which is a U.S. law which was passed in April of 2018, um, modifying Amendment 230 of the Communication Decency Act. And if you're unfamiliar with CDA 230, I highly encourage you to look it up and do some research. Hacking Hustling has some resources on it um, because we have the Earn It Bill coming down the pipeline, which would also amend this uh, which would also amend CDA 230. And what it does is now platforms are responsible for the content that their users are posting, which leaves them with huge legal liability and resulted in the shuttering of a lot of sites. So despite this back page, a website which sex workers use to advertise their services was taken down just days before FOSTA-SESTA was signed into law. So it was very difficult to tell what was directly in effect of FOSTA-SESTA. Um, and what we've noticed um, in our research, we interviewed 100 people who use online-based uh, platforms to advertise their sex work. Um, we noticed an increase of financial instability, an increase of violence, um, a lack of community where people would use to share harm reduction techniques and connect with other people in their circumstances. Um, and we did a secondary survey of about 40 street-based sex workers from an amazing group called Whose Corner Is It Anyway in Massachusetts. Um, and while they had no idea that sesta pasta had been passed, um, it didn't affect them at all, even though they are more vulnerable to trafficking by nature of being on the street and having less of a barrier between themselves and their clients, they noted that there was an increase of street-based sex workers. So what we're seeing is people who no longer have the means to advertise online turning to the much more dangerous situation of street-based work in order to support themselves. Yeah, so people who could previously afford to work online or who had regular access to technology were then pushed into more precarious working conditions. So while FOSTA-SESTA was signed into law, it was signed into law 97-2, it was a bipartisan bill, and it was framed under the language of stopping human trafficking. Um, so if, if there's one thing that you walk away from this conference with is that these, these apps that are just surveilling marginalized communities while saying that they're saving people, please be wary of those apps. Um, please be aware of the way that language around human trafficking and child pornography are being used to push bipartisan bills, which are signed in a way that radically alter the internet and internet infrastructure. Um, and I also, I also wanna mention that because of COVID-19 and the increased financial precarity that people are now in, we are going to see an increase in the numbers of trafficking. And I really just don't want more surveillance being implemented as the answer. The answer is, increasing the access to money to marginalized communities is what will actually make a meaningful impact on uh, ending trafficking. Um, dude. And, and I would really encourage you to look up the Earn It Bill, which is being pushed through Congress in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it also amends the 230 of the Communication Decency Act. And what it proposes is to make a 19 person commission of random people headed by bar, which would make random um, rules of how you would earn CDA 230 uh, protection. Um, and so this is just a way to end encrypted messaging, which people used to stay safe. So people really lost access to the communities that they work with, which actually makes people more vulnerable to trafficking and labor exploitation as does increased financial precarity. Uh, one thing we noticed was that people were talking about uh, taking work that they were less comfortable with because of the need to take care of themselves and their family because of this bill. It's also important to note that the language in FOSTA-SESTA is incredibly vague. Um, a lot of people are left without knowing if they are saying something that could incriminate themselves or if just sharing harm reduction techniques on how to stay safe is thus incriminating them for traffic. So what we've done with this law has taken away the infrastructure that people have created in order to share safety tips and in order to learn how to vet their clients, um, in order to keep blacklists of violent clients and potential police. So all of those resources get sort of pulled in with the idea that any resource about, you know, selling sex on the internet is immediately sex yeah. trafficking. And FOSTA SESTA has never been tried in the court of law at this point in time. And still we've seen like the shuttering of like 
hundreds of websites, tons of harm reduction working tools that sex workers uh, use to stay safe. What's striking about SESTA FOSTA is its, its circulation across the globe. So impact, you know, in a lot of spaces, uh, folks who study different kinds of um, legal systems and approaches to addressing sex work, prostitution, and trafficking, we have these shorthands like criminalization or, you know, decriminalized model. I think what's striking is that places like New Zealand have, have had the impact of FOSTA kind of um, impact workers there in creating restrictions. And one thing that I think, or many things that were said that are important um, um, uh, and shared by um, Danielle and Ariel in their piece and, and just now is like really taking seriously a range of harms. I mean, what I would call kind of networked harms. And, you know, in the critical trafficking space, we talk about the harms of the criminal legal system. So arrests or um, different kinds of punishment. But I think what they're pointing to and what sex worker activists have really importantly spotlighted that I certainly think we ought to pay attention to are a range of harms that might not be necessarily directly resulting in an arrest but can lead to a kind of um, massive infrastructure of, of surveillance um, of which we're not fully kind of, uh, not, not we being all of us here, but, but we, there's not a lot of public discussion, um, namely because some of these systems of response are proprietary. Um, and I just wanted to say briefly, we've talked about um, the importance of learning about Section 230. This is the Communication Act that was previously described. But I think also in this moment where there's a global spotlight on police racialized injustice and harm, thinking about how um, technologies are being called upon to, to do a lot of the work of policing. And if there's one thing I think FOSTA offers a case study in is a kind of new version of, of uh, what I call networked policing or networked governance that's putting new kinds of expectations on platforms to police what's happening. Um, and based on reports from sex worker rights organizers about shadow bans and changes to terms of use of service, I think these are the questions we really need to pay attention to, especially as you know, we're in a moment where there are calls to defund police or shift certain policing functions away from sworn officers. How are tech platforms and companies going to be asked to regulate their networks and to what effect? So there are a lot of ramifications to FOSTA that are um, focused on um, sex work and um, how to assist uh, people in trafficking situations, but also network policing trends beyond the case of trafficking. Uh, Sam, your article analyzes the shutting down of sex work websites, uh, but from a different angle. You compare the public reaction of the shutting down of My Red Book, a site used by female sex workers, and the shutting down of Rent Boy, a site used by gay male sex workers. So can you please tell us about your findings? Sure. Um, so I was drawn to this project because um, as long as you all probably are aware, these were two very similar sites. The only difference being um, that Redbook was mostly women sex workers marketing uh, or selling, offering services to uh, male purchase or clients and Rent Boy was mostly, uh, was male sex workers um, offering services to male clients. And so um, what was interesting was when these sites were shut down by federal agencies within barely two years is the public responses were very different. And what I was struck by immediately was the New York Times, which uh, as we all know is home to Nicholas Kristof and you know reams of uh, conflating tra trafficking with sex work and everything else like that. And so suddenly the New York Times published this um, op-ed saying, this is so terrible that Rent Boy has been shut down. These poor sex workers are not going to be able to sell their services and stay safe. And I thought, well, that's interesting because you haven't said the same thing about women in the sex industry and especially almost two years ago when Red Book was shut down. So what I did was I looked at the coverage the media coverage, so a, a, a wide range of media um, from magazines to newspapers across the US. And uh, I looked at not only the volume of coverage, but what it was saying uh, as a way of gauging uh, the public response to these two uh, shutdowns. And as you can imagine, the responses were somewhat predictable. So there was uh, very little response to the My Red Book shutdown in terms of volume. It was mostly concentrated in West Coast newspapers. And a lot of the discussion was about exploitation and kind of this debate in the news about whether shutting down um, 
Red Book was going to make it more dangerous for sex workers or it was going to hamper the police's efforts to um, help to investigate trafficking. Uh, whereas when whereas when the Rent Boy website was shut down, there was a much more robust public response. And uh, a lot of the discussion focused not only on issues of sex worker rights for male sex workers, but also LGBT rights. And you saw this huge outpouring of support from not only the sex worker community, but also the LGBT movement, which then I think calls into question some of the politics um, around sex worker rights organizing and the different alliances that sex workers have been able to make. And there's been a large critique of the mainstream LGBT rights movement that it has largely come to become increasingly white and to quote Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, respectable. So focus on this idea of respectability politics, mainly around pursuing things like marriage and access to the military and cleaning up um, and making uh, neighborhoods safe. And so uh, what we see suddenly uh, in this uh, coverage of, of the rent boy closure was that suddenly um, gay men were not necessarily protected by their respectability politics anymore. And that it was possibly time for them to develop more solidarities uh, with the sex worker rights community because um, especially the leaders of uh, Rent Boy who are, who are white, wealthy men, uh, their, their whiteness and their wealth no longer protected them from the vice squad. And so the article, I try to point to some possibilities for uh, sex workers and for mainstream um, LGBT organizations, especially to partner more in ways that they haven't in the past. Um. So basically, Foster says the you know the the shutting down of sex work ads websites, uh, which was announced as a measure to combat trafficking, has been in place for two years now, slightly more than two years. Is there any data that trafficking in the sex industry has been reduced in the U.S. or you know, uh, is there any data on the effectiveness of Foster Sesta? Um, I would put myself with Stephanie and uh, others in the skeptics camp. Um, there hasn't, to my knowledge, been any um, evidence that these shutdowns have abolished the sex industry, which was kind of the overriding goal of these initiatives. But what we do know is that um, sex workers are still arrested. Um, and we do know that uh, increasingly law enforcement tends to focus their efforts into online uh, policing, especially in the US because that's where most um, sex work uh, exchanges take place. But um, as for, you know, has this eradicated sex trade, the sex trade and sex traffic in course of sex work more generally? Probably not. Um, and if anybody has some data show, showing that I'm wrong, I, I would really love to see it. significant proportion of those who are prosecuted for trafficking in the United States are actually victims of trafficking. Um, and we talk about them as criminalized survivors. And these criminalized survivors are, as a function of their prosecution and conviction, required to register on sex offender registries. The technological aspect of this is that those registries are now often online, which makes criminalized survivors very vulnerable um, to kind of attack from the public because that information is publicly available. So if you are in the United States and you want to know if there's a sex offender in your community, you can go online and find out that information. And it's important to note that the people that we're talking about are often young women who are being trafficked alongside other young women who are doing things to try to help those women and who find themselves convicted of trafficking in minors. They're women who are engaged in trafficking because they are being compelled to do so by intimate partners um, who are under force or duress. Um, there are just kind of a host of these stories about women who you would legitimately characterize as victims of trafficking who end up with extremely long prison terms followed by these unbelievably onerous conditions upon their release among the registration on sex offender registries. So 
what happens as a result is that these criminalized survivors face the labeling and the stigma that comes from being on a sex offender registry. One of our clients described this as you know, the, the fear that the PTA would find out at her son's school that she had been characterized as a sex offender if she was even allowed into the school at all because the, red, the requirements of registration often keep you away, for example, from other people's children. So there's that piece of the technology, just the, the existence of these registries online. But in addition, as a uh, condition of parole or probation, oftentimes those who have been convicted of sex offenses are, are required to meet some fairly stringent uh, requirements as as refers to technology. So for example, you might not be allowed to have in New York State, you're not allowed to have a cell phone that has a camera or video. Um, and these online restrictions make it very difficult to engage in some of kind of the basics of living, um, finding work, finding housing. We live in a society that's very immediate, asks people to respond immediately to things without having access to, for example, a cell phone, which in New York State, again, you have to ask to be able to have. It may be very difficult for you to respond to an employer's call to a housing, uh, to a call about housing. In addition, you're required to waive some of your privacy rights. So anything that you do using technology uh, is impacted in that way. One fix for this that we've suggested is that states could decline to impose these conditions upon criminalized survivors. And there's a larger conversation to be had about the overuse of registries among all kinds of folks. But particularly for our piece, it would be possible for judges to say, no, these are not restrictions that are necessary given this set of circumstances. I think just we need to understand why this happens as well. And this is because of the call from the anti-trafficking industry to increase punishment for trafficking offenses. And so this is inseparable from sort of the heightened response, a heightened carceral response that's dependent on, you know, the criminal legal system for all of this. And it's these calls for punishment, calls for punishment, calls for punishment, right? And so now we have crimes, trafficking crimes that come with all this mandatory punishment built in. And that's what we need to start to roll back. Um, so it's been a product of a lot of the advocacy around human trafficking in the US for the last 20 years, probably longer, that sort of continues to point to increased punishment as a solution. And what Lee and I are just point out is, one, we oppose that across the board because we've seen its failures. Um, but second, if we're trying to do this in the name of combating human trafficking, we are making a grave error. Um, and so it is about the personal humiliation and punishment and surveillance that we describe, but it is also about a need to roll back this rush to just increase punishment over and over and over again. Part of the story of the carceral buildup includes anti-trafficking, and it also includes a kind of data-driven surveillance component. So I think in the critical trafficking scholarly um, activist spaces, there's recognition about how anti-trafficking has punitive strings attached. I think there's a, a really important and growing literature on that. I think what our piece shed some light on, though certainly I'd love it if there was more research on this, are the ways in which data and technology are kind of playing a role in that uh, in new kind of regimes you could say of punishment and surveillance that often tie together with language of protection so um, i think kind of thinking about the data piece to it and you know there are some through lines with what we have found in our special issue that are consistent with um, insights from the critical trafficking studies field and my speculation is are things doing are things happening that are different so what i mean is there's a consistent focus on anti-trafficking solutions focused on individuals and you know the criminal legal system in the us is the solution without talking meaningfully not just talking doing anything meaningfully to address structural inequities so structures still are an issue and i think the question i have kind of i'm holding and haven't fully um kind of grappled with are the ways in which technologies can really um, draw a lot of attention away from answering those structural questions. 
also how technology can be part of the ex of, a, of a kind of um, landscape of exploitation. And for any um, workers who are now consigned to homes or other spaces where they're tethered to technologies, this is the, the COVID moment's an interesting moment too to think about the future of work and how work and surveillance or work surveillance and um, uh, punishment might cohere in some newfound ways. So I think the special issue points out we still need to focus on structure. Um, but also, I think, kind of going back to an earlier point, we need to be paying attention to governance, um, whether we're talking about supply chain governance, algorithmic governance. The public is demanding technologies and platforms to do something. Um, and I think we need to, or those who care about empirical veracity, need to really spot, like, are these technologies doing what they say they're doing? And if not, what are the ways we can um, not just kind of protect people after the fact, but create systems of whether grounded in human rights principles or data protection principles that hold different tech developers to account to say, you need to think about harms on the front end before a technology is rolled out. Um, we now have a kind of break things and attempt to fix it later, if at all. My hope is that this might spark a broader conversation. And what are the new kind of ethics that we ought to have conversation about for any tech entrepreneur who wants to do something about trafficking or any number of social justice issues? And to have a more robust discussion that includes the law, but isn't limited to thinking about individual um, privacy rights and protections. It's a piece of it, but I think ethics is far broader and um, really ought to be something we talk a lot more about. It's just very clear um, from all of the work in this issue and all of the work that people have been doing in this space for the last uh, decade or so that the solutions are going to come from workers and migrants and sex workers. Um, and all of those in marginalized communities rather than from the tech corporations platforms um, and governments themselves right and so it is on us as researchers to amplify those voices um, right from the ground up um, if there are going to be anything like solutions uh, produced so that's something to keep in mind the more and more high-tech data-driven solutions do not necessarily pan out in larger solutions to the issue and, and I would just um, add that I think uh, research is one of the few ways right now that we can try to hold a number of these tech solutionists accountable. Um, I just know in my current work uh, on celebrities anti-trafficking uh, efforts that um, in trying to do some research on Ashton Kutcher's efforts with his what's called spotlight technology to help law enforcement is that it's impossible to get any information um, about a lot of these um, apps and different technologies and so i think um, the ways that we research uh, should not only be aimed at finding out information about how these apps work but actually how to get information about the apps themselves and try to hold these developers who are you know often shielded by layers of uh, corporate and other protection uh, for, for how to it, how to figure out how to actually just get that information in the first place. For me, one of the biggest challenges for researchers is how do we actually access understanding and learning more about these technologies when um, there's a lot of gatekeeping and arguably kind of door shutting for scholars and researchers who might want to kind of have some clear empirical sense of what these technologies are capturing, what they, if they, if what they're aiming to do is what they're actually doing um, for anti-trafficking tech projects. We need to have a more robust framework um, grounded in worker, um, you know, work, worker rights, human rights, about um, requiring developers to have some degree of, you know, ethical um, risk management, but also transparency about the tools that are being developed. Um, where there, wh whether there's political will for that remains to be seen, but I, I do think we need a kind of new animating framework to um, to really hold different actors to account because it is such a diffuse field and it's hard to um, properly research it where um, many people can say they don't want to cooperate with researchers.